Let's continue with our discussion here, though. According to Pew Research, 63% of Muslim Americans do not see a conflict between being a devout Muslim and living in a modern society. Yeah. Would you not say that's encouraging? No, I think, I think it's true uh, that there, there, are, there are differences between American Muslims, which I think has a, uh, America has a stronger assimilationist pull uh, than most Western countries. If you look at, at figures from Western Europe, for example, 36% uh, 30 of young Muslims believe that apostasy, as they call it, i.e. leaving Islam to become an atheist or perhaps to become a Christian, as a fellow did in Rome a couple of weeks ago, uh, that that should be punished by death. Now, that's not 36% of young Muslims in Yemen or Waziristan. That's 36% of young Muslims in the United Kingdom. Uh, so if Islam is your principal source of population growth, as it is in Britain, uh, that does pose a challenge to the state. But two-thirds suggest there's nothing... Well, 36, no whatever difficult. you say about 36%, 36 percent it by definition is not extreme it's mainstream the 40 percent of uh, British Muslims who want to live under Sharia in the United Kingdom by definition 40 percent cannot be extreme that's mainstream and uh, and I think all I, I'm not you know I I would imagine that in the course of a, uh, an average month uh, I meet with at least as many Muslims as uh, as your uh, other guests here who don't want to meet with me uh, and mm -hmm. I get on fine with them, I get into discussions with them, I, I often find myself sitting next to Muslims who are horrified at what has been done in the name of their faith. Muslims who were at, at colleges, particularly Muslim women, who were at colleges in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and, and it would never have occurred to them uh, that you would have, uh, the, uh, in effect, uh, this retrograde version, fundamentalist version of Islam, as the loudest voice in Islam you, in the early 21st century. Do you not century. think there will be significant differences between, say, a second-generation Muslim and a fourth-generation Muslim? Well, you, you, you've kind of uh, changed the math a little there. If you take, for example, the second-generation Muslim uh, whose husband was arrested in the uh, so-called plot to behead the Canadian Prime Minister, uh, she, she is hot for jihad, as the phrase my accusers object to. But she actually is hot for jihad. Uh, she named her baby after a Chechen uh, a rebel uh, killed by the Russians, and she wanted her husband to sign a prenup committing himself to jihad. Dear old Marvin Mitchelson, who used to uh, represent Zsa, Zsa Gabor, would love to have had a uh, slice of the jihad prenup uh, business. Now, her father, interestingly, is the pharmacist at the Princess Patricia's base in Alberta. He's a loyal first-generation Muslim Canadian. His second-generation daughter is a seething radical jihadist. That's so, upside-down assimilation. Why do you think that is? Well, I think in part because the modern... And again, I think it's about them... Uh, it's about us, not them, that I think the modern multicultural state, in a sense, is a nullity. Uh, it doesn't give enough, uh, an, if, if you're searching for identity, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't give you enough of an identity to, uh, to cling on to. And not everyone, uh, not everyone will need it. If, you, if, you got off, if you're in America and you got off the Mayflower 400 years ago, uh, the fact that your, your uh, grade school is raising you in a kind of multicultural vacuum doesn't matter. You're secure enough. But if, if your grandfather left a faraway country you've lost all connection with, and, and, and the country that you're now living in uh, is mired in relativist mush, uh, you might well look elsewhere for an identity. Not everyone will, but a certain percentage, as we see, do. Your treatment of the demographic shifts has been called alarmist. Are you alarmist? I don't think so. The Archbishop of Canterbury said uh, just a couple of weeks ago that... Uh, uh, that uh, the introduction of Islamic law to the United Kingdom is inevitable, so we might just uh, as well get on with it. I don't see... And you uh, saw it, the reaction. Uh, yeah, a lot of people were outraged by mm -hmm. it, uh, and then it all subsided. We, hear, we heard just a few weeks ago that, that uh, uh, other, other cabinet ministers, other prominent figures in Europe, a, uh, a Dutch cabinet minister who said he would have no objection uh, if people voted to introduce Islamic law. That's an interesting concession from a Dutch cabinet minister when Rotterdam and Amsterdam are essentially already 50% Muslim. Swedish cabinet minister of justice says uh, uh, we should be nice to the Muslims now so that when they're in the majority, they'll be nice to us. I, I, think, it's, I think it's a fascinating story and I would love to talk, I would love to talk about it. If these guys uh, who are sitting over here and don't want to talk about it, uh, would, would, I, I don't understand. They've been asking for a debate for four or five months. Well, stand I'd by. be happy to have a debate. I'm Come gonna, on over, guys. Hey, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Mark, I'm obviously, here to debate. I'm only in Toronto Mark, once every couple of years. Come Mark, on over, have the debate. Obviously, there are no chairs over here. 
Well, come They're on. They're over there. It's not a chair just a issue. Just a minute. <laughs> the chairs are over there. Just a minute. I'll go over there. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to ask. Yeah. Stand by. Okay. Michael, roll some tape. Get me over there, and I'll be right back. <laughs> 